After the very important map, filter and reduce methods, we still have some more methods to learn, which are also super important and used all the time. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the find method. So as the name says, we can use the find method to retrieve one element of an array based on a condition. So let's again use our movement. And so find, and just like the other methods that we've been talking about, the find method also accepts a condition. And just like the other array methods we've been talking about, the find method also accepts a callback function, which will then be called as the method loops over the array. All right, so find is basically just another method that loops over the array, but then it does something different. And in this case, what the find method does is to retrieve an element of the array. So as always, the current element of the iteration is the movement, and then here we specify a condition. So let's say movement less than zero. So basically, uh, this is here a withdrawal, right? So a negative movement. So you see that just like the filter method, the find method also needs a callback function that returns a boolean. So the result of this is of course either true or false. Now unlike the filter method, uh, the find method will actually not return a new array, but it will only return the first element in the array that satisfies this condition. So basically, in other words, the first element in the array for which this operation here becomes true. And so basically this here will return the first withdrawal. So first with withdrawal is this. So let's lock the movements again to the console. And then let's also lock the first withdrawal. And so indeed, minus 400 here is the very first value that appears in the array that is negative. Okay? So, as you see, the find method is a bit similar to the filter method. But there are two fundamental differences. First, filter returns all the elements that match the condition, while the find method only returns the first one. And second, and even more important, the filter method returns a new array, while find only returns the element itself and not an array. Okay? So make sure that you understand this fundamental difference. Now, this example here is not really exciting. And so let's now take it to the next level and start actually working with our array of objects. So that's this accounts array, remember? So this array, which contains the four objects where each of them is one account. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a pretty common data structure uh, in JavaScript. And so let's now work with this together with the find method. Because in this context, the find method actually becomes really useful. So that's because uh, using find, we can now basically uh, find an object in the array based on some property of that object. And so that's really cool. So let me show it to you. So let's create a variable called account, and it's going to be accounts, so all the accounts, dot find, and then our callback. And so as we loop over accounts, uh, each of the current elements is one account. Okay? And so now let's say we want to select one of the accounts by the name. Now, uh, this disappeared here, so let's bring it back. Okay? So let's say we want to get the account where the owner is Jessica Davis, right? So we can simply do account dot owner equals Jessica Davis. So let's see, just the account. And indeed, we get now only this object. And this is really, really powerful of arrays and objects. 
so where one array contains multiple objects, which all have a similar structure. So all of them here have an owner, have a movement, uh, a pin, a username, and so on and so forth. So using the find method, we can then search this array, basically to find an object that matches a certain uh, property that we already know. So in this case, that property that we know is the name. All right. And so we simply compare uh, Jessica Davis here with the account owner. And whenever this condition here is true, well, then that object is returned. So usually the goal of the find method is to just find exactly one element. And therefore, we usually set up a condition where only one element can satisfy that condition. And so that's why we used the equal operator here. Okay, so if the owner names are unique, then this equal operator here will only ever match one account uh, with this name here. All right, and we will actually use this in the next couple of lectures to implement the login feature and also some other features. Now, I'm going to leave it to you here as a challenge to implement this functionality using the for off loop, uh, just like we have been doing it with some of the other methods like map and filter. So we have also been implementing these using the for off loop uh, just to see the difference. But now I'm not going to do that, but I'm leaving it here uh, as an idea for you to do that. Now, anyway, let's go now to the next video and actually start to implement the login functionality. Let's now finally implement the login feature of our application. And this is going to be a lot of work. So let's get started right away. And to start, let's take a look at our demo application. So in this case here, uh, in the beginning, we cannot see anything. So there's no logged in user. And then we can input a username. And so this is the kind of username that we computed before, remember, and then the pin. And if that is correct, so if the pin corresponding to this account is correct, uh, then we get logged in. And that's going to happen whether we click on this button here or hit the enter key. And so then all of this appears. So all the values here are calculated. And yeah, so that's the main thing that we need to do uh, in this lecture. And then of course, if someone else logs in, then their values are going to be displayed. And so let's take a look at the HTML here of this uh, form. So indeed, here we have a form element and this form has a button. And so it's onto this login button that we will attach the add event listener method. Then as for the inputs, uh, the username is going to come from this one with this class, login user dash dash input, and the pin is going to come from this one. And as always, I already have uh, all of this here selected. So this is the button here. And then we have input login username and input login pin. Okay, so let's now create these event handlers. So event handlers right here. So button login, add event listener for the click. And then as always, our callback function. And here, let's just log to the console login. Okay. And now, uh, did you see what happened here? Take a close look uh, down here what happens as we click. So for a flash there, uh, you saw the login and then the page reloaded, right? And that's because this is the button in a form element. And so in HTML, the default behavior when we click the submit button is for the page to reload. So we need to stop that from happening. And for that, we need to actually give this function here the event parameter. And let's just call it event. And you already know uh, how this callback function gets access to this event object, remember? And so on that event, we can call a method called prevent default, like this. 
And so as the name says, this will then prevent uh, this form from submitting. So prevent form from submitting. So let's do that again. And now we fix that problem and we can see login. Okay. Now another thing that's great about forms is that whenever we have one of these fields here inputted and when we then hit enter like this, then that will actually automatically trigger a click event on this button. Okay. So once again, uh, hitting enter in this field or in this field is exactly the same as the user clicking right here. So both of these things will trigger a click event. So you see, as I hit enter, we get more and more click events. So that's why we get then uh, login locked to the console. But now let's do the actual work. So to lock the user actually in, we need to find the account from the accounts array with the username that the user inputted. And so that's where our find method comes into play again. So we can do accounts.find. And then this is actually the same that we did in the last video. So account.owner should be the same as, so three equals actually. And so remember, we have this value at input login username. Okay, so that is this element here. And then from there, we need to take the value property. Remember that? So we did this here, uh, I think in the guess my number game, where we also read the value out of an input field. And so here, this is the same. Uh, and so now let's actually save this into a variable. Now this variable needs to be defined uh, outside of this function. Okay. And that's because we will need this information about the current account uh, also later in other functions. So it's a good thing to have this big important information outside of this function so that we can then remember it uh, for other actions in our application. For example, when we transfer money here, then we need to know from which account uh, that money should actually go. And so for that, we need the current account. So current account, and here we just define it. And that's why we need a let. And so then here we assign it this value. So current account. Okay, so let's check that. So JS, and we get undefined. So there was some problem here. And the problem is, uh, as I see right away, is that we are looking for the owner, but we need to look for the username. So the owner is the whole name, but the username property is these properties that we created earlier. So here in this function, remember? So we need to compare this value here that the user inputs, of course, to that username. So try that again. And now here we get the object which has exactly this username. All right, and so it is here uh, my object, basically. All right, so we got the uh, user that is trying to log in, and now all we need to do in order to actually log the user in is to check if the pin is correct. So pin here is like a password, but something that we usually use like in an ATM, and so I decided to just go with that here because I think this also looks a little bit like an ATM machine here. So let's then do that test. So if current account uh, dot pin is equal to input login pin. Okay, so that's the variable that holds the selection of selecting this element. And then again, we need to take the value. And finally, we also need to convert this uh, to a number because as I mentioned earlier, this value will always be a string. All right. And so here, before we do anything, let's just log in again here to the console. Okay. So JS and we got logged in. 
But if we only input JS, then we simply get the object itself, but without being logged in because the pin is correct. And now let's try just some other user to see what happens here. And we get an error. So that error is cannot read property pin of undefined. And so the reason for this is that this object here uh, is now undefined, right? Because no account could be found uh, for this username. And so the find method, so this one here, will return undefined if no element matches this condition. So that's something that we haven't seen before. And so that's why I'm showing this to you. But anyway, how should we solve this? Well, the first thing that might come into mind is to simply check if the current account exists like this. Okay, so this would fix the problem, but we can do better because we already learned about something called optional chaining, remember? So we can do this and then this pin property will only be read uh, in case that the current account here actually exists. Remember that? And so this is a lot easier and a lot more elegant. So let's try that. And so now nothing happened. So no error. All we get here is the undefined because yeah, this account does not exist. But that's of course not a problem. Okay, but now in case that the account does exist and that the pin is correct, what should we do? Well, let's take a look at our flowchart here. So this is the part we already checked. So if we have the correct credentials, right? And so if yes, then we should display the UI and the welcome message. So let's write that here in our script, put that here. And so I like to kind of plan out what I'm doing here using comments. So display UI and a welcome message. Uh, next up, we should display and calculate the balance, then the same with the summary and the same with the movements. Okay, this part here we are leaving for the next section about the timer. Okay, so display balance, summary and movements. So display movements, display balance, display, summary. And let's start with the message here. So that is this element here. So let me inspect that. So it's this paragraph here called welcome. And so as always, I already have that uh, selected. So it's a label, so probably it's called uh, label welcome label, uh, indeed, here it is, label welcome dot text content, as always. And then here we are going to write welcome back and then the first name of the person. Welcome back. And then the owner of the current account. So that's current account dot owner and then only the first word. So how do we do that? Well, we use our good friend split. And we split it with the space. So as I said, we use this one all the time. And then from the resulting array, we simply take the first element like this. Okay, so this displays the message. And now about displaying the UI, uh, remember how in the beginning we set the opacity here uh, from zero, basically back to 100, which is the default. So usually uh, the opacity here is at zero, and so now when we log the user in, we actually set this opacity here to 100. So as we save this now, it will all disappear. And so now what we will do is the uh, container app, I think. Yes. So container app is the element that we selected previously, which has this app class. Okay. So this element we will manipulate the style and in particular the opacity style. 
Now, remember how I said in another project that it's also good to use classes for this, okay? But in this case, it's really just one style, so it's not a big work to just do it like this. So let's test this one out for now. So JS and my pin, and indeed, we get our message here, and also we get everything here now back to visible. And Jessica Davis now, which has pin 2222. And so now we also get Jessica. Now, as you see, these uh, balances and these movements here, they are all still hard coded from what we had uh, back here. So here we called calc display summary and also the balance and the movements. But now we want to do that not here, uh, but actually inside of the login function. So let's remove all of this. Again, because we do not want to call these functions uh, right in the beginning when our script is loaded. We only want to calculate and display the balance and the movements and the summary as soon as we actually get the data that we want to display. Right? That makes sense. So let's remove all of that and actually do it here. So, display movements, and then it is the current account dot movements, right? And that's because this method here, or actually this function here, it expects a movement argument. And as we hover this function name, VS Code is so smart that it actually shows it to us here. And so from there, we can immediately see what we need to pass into the function. So that's really handy. Then the same with the balance. So display or calc display balance actually. And so once again, let's just hover this here to make sure what we need. And it is the movements. So that data is stored in the current account dot movements. And finally also the summary. So calc display summary and once again we will need the movements so that data is in current account dot movements all right now we will have to come back to this function here by the end of this lecture but for now let's leave it like this and let's log in again first with jonas and so this is the data that we are already used to seeing this balance value and this movements here because we have always been uh, printing these values here using that account. But now, as we log in as Jessica Davis, you will see that these values here will all change accordingly. So let's see. And yes. So that's great. Now we are getting all of these values, so this data here dynamically, uh, really from the account object itself. So we have all her movements, we calculated all of these statistics or summaries and of course also the balance is now really about this account itself. And we have more. Let's try Stephen here. So Stephen Thomas Williams with pin 3333 and this uh, kind of messed up our UI here because of this calculation. So Stephen only has a balance of 10 euros and now finally we can try Sarah Smith. And so once again, we see all her different movements here. And yeah, this is great. So this now really works uh, depending on the user's data. So let's go back here. Um, so what I want to do next is to, as we log in, also get rid of this data here. Okay. So basically emptying these two fields and also as we log in like this, uh, I didn't want this field here to lose its focus. So let's do that before this. So clear the input fields. And so we already know that the fields are input login username, which we want to set to the empty string and then also input login pin. 
And we can do it like this. Login, pin, also set it to equal, because the assignment operator works from right to left. So it will start here, assigning equal to this field here. And then this here will become the empty string. And so then empty string will also be assigned to this one. We are just missing the dot value here. Otherwise, we would set the entire element to the empty string. All right. So JS1111. One, 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 one. Okay. And now this happens, what I mentioned before, is that this field here still has this focus. So we can see the cursor there blinking. And so that's a bit ugly. And so on that field, so input login pin, we can use this blur function or method. So just call blur. And so that will make it so that this field loses its focus. So you see, now it looks great. And now just to finish, we also need to come back to this function here, just as I mentioned earlier. So call display summary, and let's go there. So this one here, and as you see, we calculated the interest using this 1.2 rate, right? So right now, for all of the accounts, the interest rate is now calculated using this 1.2 interest rate. However, as we take a look at the accounts, each of them actually has a different interest rate. So this one has 1.2, but this one has 1.5. And this one has less, so it gets a less interest. And so now, of course, we also want to uh, dynamically use this interest rate uh, depending on the current user. Right? That makes sense. And so we have to modify this uh, function here a little bit. And so in order to get access to that data, so to that interest rate, we now need more than just the movements. Instead of the movements, we want now the entire account. Because then we can take the movements from the account and also the interest rate. All right. So again, we will now change this function and pass in the entire account and not just the movements array. And so then from there, we will be able to take the movements that we need to calculate these three statistics here and then also the interest rate uh, that we have here. So account, let's just call it, or let's just call ACC one more time. So here, now we need to take the movements from that account, the same here and here. All right. And now here, instead of this 1.2 fixed rate, we take ACC dot the interest rate that's in there. All right. So let's just see if everything still works. And let's see it with uh, Steven. So that was STW and 3333. Uh, and you see that now our UI is no longer messed up. Ah, but of course we forgot to call this function here correctly. That's probably why we got this error. Yeah, right. So, so down here we are still calling this function uh, only with the movements array. So we need to instead pass in the entire account, because as you see, now we do need the account here. So try that again. TW. And so now we get the correct interest. And maybe you remember that before it was different. It was this crazy long number with a lot of zeros, which messed up our user interface here. So. This means that it is now uh, being calculated differently for each of the user according to their own specific interest rate. Great. And with this, we implemented all of the tasks that we had in our flowchart for this functionality. And in practice, what this means is that for the first time, we made all of this data that we see here in our application dynamic. So depending on which user is actually logging in. So let's see that change again. Let's try a, a wrong pin here. And so now nothing happens. 
And of course, we could now uh, hide the user interface and display an error message, but I wanna keep it simple here. So this is just a simple learning application. So we don't need to mess with all of that. What matters is only the uh, correct version for now. And so with the correct pin, now as you saw, the data changed here back to this Jonas account. Awesome, that's great. So that's really great progress. Congratulations uh, for making it this far in this section. Uh, I know there's a lot to learn and a lot to take in, but I hope that this lecture too uh, was clear to you how everything worked here. And just to recap, uh, clearly the most important part here is uh, the usage of this find method here and knowing that this is the correct method for the job. So maybe analyze this line here a little bit and then see exactly what happens here. Uh, also this nice usage of the optional chaining. And then we are ready to implement our next feature, which is going to be transferring money from one of our users to another. In this video, we're gonna implement our next feature, which is to transfer money from one user to another. And this is how transfers work. So here we input the username of the user to which we want to transfer, and then here the amount. Okay, and so now we need to attach an event handler to this button here. And then we're gonna take a look at our flowchart to see what we have to do. Okay, but let's start to take a look here at this element. So it is the button form, and then we will take our values from form input amount and form input two. So that's input transfer two and input transfer amount. And the button is button transfer. So as always, I already selected them here beforehand. So let's use button transfer dot add event listener click and then our function and we will actually need our event here again because just like before we need to do event dot prevent default because this one is also a form and so without this uh, if we clicked here then that would reload the page. So this here is pretty common to do uh, when we're working with forms. So preventing the default behavior. Okay. Now, right. So let's uh, create some data here based on the input data and starting with the amount. So the amount to transfer is input transfer amount dot value. And then we need to convert it once again to a value or to a number actually. Okay. Oh, and now as I uh, reload here, of course we lose uh, all this data. So this current data that we need. So now we will have to start to log in always here. And we could find a way around this, but yeah, let's just keep logging in whenever we have to check our code. So anyway, we have the amount and then we also want to figure out the account to which we want to transfer. So const receiver account. And now uh, the value is of course in input transfer uh, to dot value. So that is the string that's gonna be right here. So for example, uh, if we want to transfer to Jessica Davis, that's going to be a JD, right? However, that value alone, so that username alone is not that helpful. It is only helpful when we use it to then actually find the account object to which we want to transfer, all right? And so for that, we once again use the find method. So that's accounts. So that's the uh, array holding all the accounts and then we have the current account and we want to find account where the username is equal to this value that we put in here. All right. So to recap here, 
we are now looking for the account which has uh, this value here. So that's going to be the username value that we input into that form so to which we want to transfer. And so here we are looking for the account with the username which is equal to that inputted username. And then we select that from the account once more using the find method here. Okay, so we have this data. Let's just check if it is correct here by logging it all to the console. So also the receiver account. So this should be a comma. So I'm logging in as JS with this pin. And now let's say I transfer to Jessica Davis. That's JD, 100 euros. And now in the console, we indeed get 100 and the account with the username that I just inputted there. Great. So let's see what we have to do now. So what we will do is to add a negative movement to the current user and add a positive movement to the recipient. And that makes sense, right? So if I transfer 100 to someone, I should lose that 100 and the other person should receive that 100. Otherwise, we would just be creating new money, right? So we do that and then we update the UI again. So we show again the movements, summary and balance because all of that will be affected by this transfer. Now what's kind of missing here in this flowchart is that we also actually uh, first need to check some stuff. So we need to check if the amount here is actually a, a positive number and we also need to check if the current user, so Jonas uh, right now, actually has enough money. So I should not be able to transfer 5,000 if I only have like 3,000 and something. Okay, so let's implement that check first. So as I just said, the amount needs to be greater than zero. Otherwise we could do a negative transfer and basically transfer money to ourselves. So this needs to happen. And also the balance of the current account needs to be greater or equal the amount that we're trying to transfer. Now, this balance value is actually not stored anywhere, right? So in the place where we calculate this balance, so that's right here. So calc display balance, all we do is to calculate it and then display it immediately on the user interface. But we do not save it anywhere. So let's actually change that. So besides only displaying it on the user interface, we also want to save it in the account. Now, how do we get access to that account? Well, we will do the same as we did previously with, uh, with this function here, where now instead of the movements, we pass in the entire account. And so then we will be able to read the movements here uh, from that account and also we will be able to then create a new property on that account with the balance. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So we are changing it from movements and so now we will be calling it with an entire account object. So here we need to do account.movements and before we move on any further, let's call this correctly. So calc display balance should now only be called with the entire account object and not only with the uh, movements array. Okay, so here it is. So now we take the movements from the account object and then we can add that. So we can say account.balance equals balance. And uh, in fact, we can make this even better we can store this value here immediately in account.balance. So let's do that. Account.balance here. And then we get that property here from account.balance as well. Great. And remember why all of this works. And we have some error here, but that doesn't matter. It's something unrelated. Now, anyway, let's remember why all of this works. So why we can set 
uh, this property here on this account object that we receive and it will then uh, set that right here on these objects that we have here. Well, and the reason is that, uh, once again, all of these different references do actually point to the exact same objects in the memory heap, okay? So when we access this account one uh, object here, so down here in the login function, so right here, where we create this current account variable, uh, this is of course not really a copy of the object itself. So just as we learned before. This is simply another variable which points to the same, so to the original object in the memory heap, okay? So this uh, current account object, again, is exactly one of these objects that we have right here. So one of the objects of the account uh, array, right? They are the exact same object, they simply have different name. Here it is called account1, but then down here, it might be called the current account, okay? And then we use that current account to pass it into this calc display balance function. And so then inside of that function, it will have even another name. So here it will be called ACC, but it's still the same object, okay? It's still pointing to the same place in the heap, so in the memory, all right? And therefore, setting the balance property here on ACC is exactly the same as setting it uh, up there where we first defined the objects, okay? And I will show you that in practice in a second. But now let's go here. And so this is where this error comes from because we don't have any code block and also because there is no second operand here. So anyway, let's go back to this condition here. So we already defined that the transfer can only happen if the amount is greater than zero. And now the second part is that the current user needs to have enough money to do this transfer. And so that means current account dot balance, which is the property that we just defined. All right. So we calculated the balance and that needs to be at least uh, equal to the amount that we're trying to transfer. Okay. Also, we should not be able to transfer money to our own account. So let's add that condition as well. So what we're trying to say is that the receiver account dot username must be equal from the current account dot username. All right. And here we have one equal too much. <laughs> All right. And actually, we should also check if this receiver account actually exists. So if it doesn't exist, of course, it makes no sense to transfer money there. So we could add that here, like simply uh, testing this. But instead, uh, since we're already trying to read a property from that object here, we can use once again optional chaining, like this. And so then, if this object here doesn't exist, then immediately this here will become undefined and the whole end operation will fail. And so in this case, we don't need that. Let me just comment it out. And so now this should work. And so let's just log something to the console. So transfer valid. And now I will check all of these conditions here. So let's log in. And now I want to transfer again to Jessica Davis and I will try to transfer zero. So we get zero, but we do not get transfer valid. So that means we didn't enter this if block here. Now let's try to transfer more than I have. And so this is also not valid, but now 500. And so all of these should now be true. So you see, transfer valid. Uh, if I try something else, then again, nothing should happen. Oh, and actually it does happen. So uh, indeed the receiver account is undefined. And so this here will now be uh, undefined. Oh, but I see what's happening. 
because all that we are asking here is for this here to be different than the current account dot username. And so JS is of course different than undefined and therefore this here is still true. And so in fact, we need to do this as well. So let's try this again. And so you see, of course, bugs like this can happen all the time. And so we find them, we fix them and we move on. And of course, now we test with some wrong username there and now nothing happens. Okay, so now the transfer is not valid. Now I'm also trying to transfer to myself. And so this is also not valid. But finally, to Jessica David, it will be valid. Okay, and so now here we can finally do what we intended to do all along. So these steps that we have here. So let's do that. So the current account dot movements. So we will add one new movement. And so we're pushing here the amount, but negative. So the negative amount. And now on the receiver account, we will add a positive movement. Okay. And that's actually already it. That's the most important part of doing the transfer. So doing the transfer. And then we also want to update the user interface. So we could now copy this code here and paste it there as well, but that's not a good practice as you already know. And so I will now refactor this code here uh, all into one function. So let me grab this here. And this function will be called update UI. And it will also receive, uh, of course, the current account. So let me write now the function here, update UI equals function. And I'm going to leave it empty for now. And so indeed here, I need the current account now. Okay, so otherwise I could not call uh, these three functions then using the account. But here I can call them whatever I want again. So let me just call them account. All right, so we refactored that functionality into its own function. And so now we can call this function anywhere that we want in our code. And it will then always perform these three tasks. Okay. So here I already called it update UI. Let me just write it here also as a comment. And now all I have to do is to paste it here as well. Great. So that should be working already. So let's transfer to Jessica Davis 500. And so now I should see one negative uh, movement here. And this should also decrease by 500. And indeed it did. So let's check now here the uh, accounts variable just to see if we actually get the balance. So indeed we now have the balance property here. We also have the movements and of course it's going to contain the minus 500, right? So that's the money that we just transferred away to Jessica Davis. And indeed, uh, it should also already be in Jessica Davis. So her latest movement is now indeed 500. So let's check it out also in the user interface. Now, uh, before doing that, the final thing that we're going to do is to clean these input fields. But now just to make sure, Let's log in as Jessica Davis, and then we should get plus 500 here as the latest uh, deposit. All right. Now, as I was saying, we need to clean out these inputs now. And that we will do no matter if the transfer was successful or not. So we can do that outside of this if statement. So just down here, or actually we can do it right here. 
Let's get rid of this console.log. And then input transfer amount equal, or actually dot value equal input transfer to equal the empty string. And with this, we should be finished. Let's try it one more time. This time, Jessica Davis will transfer something. And so we lost here the latest uh, transfer, of course, because the page was reloaded. And this data, of course, then gets lost. So when our page loads, the information about the accounts, so the account data will always be exactly what we have here in our code. Okay, so that's the reason why that data, that 500 transfer, is no longer here. But that doesn't matter. So let's transfer to Stephen uh, Williams here, 1000. And we get an error here, assignment to constant variable HTML button. So at line 167, and oh, one more time, I forgot the value here. That's a very stupid mistake, <laughs> right? Let's try that again. Stephen Thomas Williams, I believe. And now it worked. So all of our statistics here were updated. And indeed, now this field, or both of the fields, are empty. And now as we go to this account, oh, apparently it does not exist. Yeah, it is Stephen Thomas Williams. Yeah, so now we get this 1,000 deposit here that we just did previously. <laughs> All right, awesome. So our application is coming more and more to life here. Welcome back. It's great to still have you here in this project. And now that we have a good grip on the find method, let me introduce you to a close cousin of the find method which is the find index method. And the find index method works almost the same way as find. But as the name says, find index returns the index of the found element and not the element itself. So let's see a great use case for find index in our application here, which is the close account feature that we have here. And in our application here, Closing an account means to basically just delete that account object from the accounts array. So from this one here, okay? So for example, if Sarah decides to close her account, then this account for will simply be deleted and that's it. Now to delete an element from an array, we use the splice method, remember? But for the splice method, we need the index at which we want to delete. And where could that index come from? And you guessed it, from the find index method. So let's first select this button here and attach an event handler to it. And so that's the button close here. So let's come down here to our event handlers. Now we have multiple. And button close dot add event listener, click, and then as always our function in which we need the uh, event object so that we can call uh, prevent default. All right, let's just test if this connection works here. Let's log in. And now as we click this here, we get delete. So that's great. And now let's take a look at our flowchart here. And so yeah, the first thing that we need to do is to check if the credentials are correct. So basically, if the username that is inputted here is equal to the current user and the same for the pin. So that doesn't sound too hard, does it? So actually, let me leave that for you as a challenge. So just write this condition here to, again, check if both the user is correct and the pin. 
All right, I hope you did that. So let's first take a look at the element names that we have up here. And so that's input close username and input close pin. So I hope you figured these uh, names out here too. And so let's now say input close uh, username dot value needs to be exactly the same as the username in the current account. So current account dot username. So this needs to be true and the same thing for the pin. So that's input close pin dot value and once again convert it to a real number and this one uh, also needs to be equal to the current account dot pin. And now let's actually do the deletion itself here. So as I already said, we are going to use the splice method to delete the current account. So let me actually start by writing that part. So we will take our accounts array and splice it at a certain index, which is the index that we're going to calculate in a second, and we will remove exactly one element. All right, and then the splice method uh, actually mutates the underlying array itself and so there's no need to save the result of this uh, anywhere. All right, and so now let's actually calculate that index at which we want to delete. So we take the accounts and now instead of find, we use find index. And once again, this one takes a callback function, which is very similar to all the other callback functions we have been using. So it's going to loop over the array essentially and in each iteration we get access to the current account and then we want to find the one where uh, the account has the username equal to the current account dot username. All right and so let's then take a look at that index and for now, let's actually take out this part. Okay. And we will then come back and maybe explain this a little bit better. So as I click this here without anything, nothing happens. So just as we intended. Then with the correct user and with a wrong pin, also nothing happens. And notice that here you cannot see the numbers I'm typing now because this is a different uh, format in HTML. But I'm still using the four ones. So one, 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 one. And now something should happen. And indeed, we get the index number of the JS account uh, in the accounts array. So let's take a look at that array here. And indeed, uh, the Jonas one is number zero. Right now, if we logged in here as uh, Stephen STW with three 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 three, and now we need to confirm that here. So STW again and three 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 three, hit enter, and then the result should be down here, and indeed it is. So that's element number two. So zero one and two. So that is correct. And so or splice here would now uh, indeed delete the user. Okay, so let's see here uh, what we did in the find index. So just like before in find, we passed in a condition. So something that will return either true or false. And the find index method will then return the index of the first element in the array that matches this condition. So for which this condition here returns true. So again, similar to find, but uh, it returns the index and not the element itself. Now you might notice that this is actually similar to the index of method that we studied before. So index uh, of, and then here we can pass in some value. All right. 
Now, the big difference here is that with index of, we can only search for a value that is in the array. So if the array contains a 23, then it's true, and if not, then it's false. But on the other hand, with find index, we can create a complex uh, condition like this one. And of course, it doesn't have to be the equality operator here. It can be anything that returns true or false. Okay, and here we can simply check uh, if the array contains this value or not, and if so, return the index of it. So both return an index number, but this one here is a lot simpler. And so now let's actually uh, delete this element here. So this current uh, user or the current account. And now let's get back here to our flowchart, which I closed for some reason. And so we just did this part. Now we also need to log out the user. So that just means to hide the UI. And so that's similar to what we did here, where we uh, showed the UI. Now we want to set it back to zero. So down here. So hide UI and here delete account. Okay. And then of course, as we reload the page, uh, as I said before, the user will then be back, of course, because we do not persist this data anywhere. All right. Well, the UI is still there. Oh, and that's because we didn't change this year to zero. But anyway, let's uh, still take a look at the accounts object uh, in this moment. And we see that we now only have three accounts left. And the one of Jonas is nowhere to be found. So this means that it actually worked. Now we just need to fix uh, this here and set it to zero. And we also, just like before, uh, want to clear these fields here. So that's uh, the same as we did before. So similar to this one. Let me just copy it here. Uh, and this one we can paste right here outside of the if statement. And then just copy these two inputs here. So close username and close uh, pin. This is set to zero. And now this should actually uh, be complete. So let's see. Well, nothing happened. Uh, so let's see here. Oh, okay. This is a, a bug that I just introduced here. So basically, before even reading the data from this field, I'm already setting it back to empty here. Okay. And so therefore, of course, nothing can work. So this needs to be after the if else statement. All right, but it's still a good thing that these small bugs keep happening here so that I can fix them and show to you that everyone makes this kind of mistakes. So let's try it again, one, 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 one. And now it's gone. And as I try to log in now as this user, you see that nothing happens and we get undefined down here. And that's because this user no longer exists now in our accounts array. Great. So one more feature uh, implemented successfully. Now there's just a couple of things I want you to note here. Uh, both the find and find index methods get access to also the current index and the current entire array. So as always, besides the current element, these other two values are also available, but in practice, uh, I never found these useful. And second, uh, both the find and find index methods were added to JavaScript in ES6. And so they will not work in like super old browsers. But don't worry, there is gonna be a lecture a little bit later on how to support all of these old browsers. So we're getting closer to the end of this section, but there are still a couple of array methods left to learn. And so in this lecture, we're gonna look at the sum and the every methods. 
And to start learning about the sum method, let's look back at the includes method that we studied earlier. So let's log to the console here. Movements dot includes minus 130. And let's also log our movements array so we can see it. And so indeed the value of minus 130 that we're testing here is in the array and that's why we get true here. And so we can use the includes method to test if an array includes a certain value. Now, however, we can only really test for equality, right? So basically includes here uh, returns true if any value in the array uh, is exactly equal to minus 130, right? And so again, this is essentially testing for equality. But what if we wanted to test for a condition instead? And so that's where the sum method comes into play. So uh, let's say that we would like to know if there has been any deposits on this account. So in other words, we want to know if there is any positive movement in this array. So any number above zero. So how would we do that? Well, we can say movements dot sum and now we can specify our condition here as always so the same callback function which has to return either true or false and so a deposit is uh, a movement uh, greater than zero so let's call this here any deposits and log it to a console and so indeed here we get true so we have of course uh, more than just one deposit here but let's say we wanted to test if there is any deposit above 5000 so easy enough we can check if there is something above this value and then it is false or we can check if there is something uh, above 1500 and so now it's true because there is one movement here uh, in that condition. And so you can see that these two methods here are kind of similar. Uh, the difference is that here it checks only for equality. So equality, but here we can uh, specify a condition. All right. So basically this one here, we could rewrite it uh, like this. So let's log it to the console here. So movements dot sum minus 130. So this would be exactly the same. And so that's why we also get true in this one. Now for equality, this doesn't make much sense. We could then simply use the includes method. But for uh, the case, we need a condition like this one here or really this one, then the sum method is perfect for that. Okay. And probably if I would have named this method, I would have called it like any, but of course that's not the real name, but that's really what it does. If so, if there is any value for which this condition is true, then the sum method will return true. All right. And now let's actually use this sum method to implement or missing functionality, which is to request a loan to the bank. So we will do that right here uh, between the uh, transfer button and the close button. And the sum method will become helpful for this loan feature because our bank has a rule which says that it only grants a loan if there is at least one deposit with at least 10% of the requested loan amount. So that sounds complicated, but we will implement this here in a second. So button loan, add event listener, click. And this is now always the same as you can see. So starting by preventing the default action. So that's always gonna be the first thing. And then uh, 
Let's take a look here at the user interface because right now it is uh, hidden. So you see that here we only have this one field. And this field is called the input loan amount. Okay, so input uh, loan amount. So that's the element with this long class name. So let's copy that actually. And so let's start by actually getting that amount here. So we already know we will have to convert uh, this input dot value. Okay. And now we need to create our condition here. So first of all, that amount should be greater than zero. Okay. And now let's take a look here at our flow chart again. So this is what I was saying earlier. Uh, the loan is only granted if there is any deposit uh, that's greater or equal 10% of the requested amount of loan. All right. So here we need now our second condition, which translates that. And so whenever we see or hear the word any, uh, we can already know that it's probably a good use case for the sum method. So let me show it to you. So as always, we get the movements from the current account object, dot movements, and now on there we call the sum method. So you already know by now how this callback function uh, feature here works. So we get the current movement in the current iteration. And now here the condition is that movement needs to be greater or equal than 10% uh, of the amount. So that's the amount divided by 10. Mm, okay. Or we could also do times 0 0.1. And so that's exactly the same thing. So 0 0.1 here stands for 10%. And so let's uh, keep it like this. Give it a save so that it looks uh, nicer. And so, yeah, if at least one of the elements uh, in the movements array uh, has this condition, so it's true, so basically is greater than 10% of the requested amount, then all of this here will become true. And so the sum method is perfect to be used in a condition like this. So when we need to test for something. Okay, so in case this is true, oh, and I closed our flow chart again. So in case this is true, then add a positive movement to the current data and update the UI. So that's easy enough. So add the movement here. So current account dot movements dot push. And then of course, the amount that was requested. And then update the UI. And for that, we already created or nice function, which does all of the functionalities in one go. And so that's update UI. And we simply pass the current account into it. Okay. And that's it. Uh, finally, let's also then uh, clear the, the input field. So that value equals empty value. So we did that here and here and also up here. Okay. Let's log in. And so you see my deposits, my largest deposit is uh, 3000. And so the loan that I can request uh, can be maximum uh, 30,000. Okay, because 3000 here is 10% of that. So let me try something bigger. So something really huge. And so now nothing happened. And again, in the real world, we would then uh, probably get some error message somewhere here at the top or so. But in this case, we're not going to do that. Let's just try 5000 now. And so now, indeed, it appeared here in our movements. And also, as you see, our balance was updated. 
and also here our total income. Okay, now let's request 50,000. And so with this, you can now actually cheat. You can always uh, create a little bit of a larger number. So now I can even request half a million. And so that's <laughs> a cheating or algorithm, which is uh, way too simple. But of course, this is just for testing purposes. All right. So that's how the sum method works. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And so let's now actually go back here and talk about the close cousin of the sum method, which is the uh, every method. So let's write here sum and every. So again, the every method is pretty similar to the sum method, but as you might guess, the difference between them is that every uh, only returns true if all of the elements in the array uh, satisfy the condition that we passed in. So in other words, if every element passes the test in our callback function, only then the every method returns true. And that's why the method is called every in the first place. So let's test it out here now. So let's log to the console movements.every and then with the same condition so let's essentially check if all of our movements here are deposits. And well, indeed, uh, they are not. And that's why we get false. However, we do have one account which only has positive movements. So let me uh, show that to you. That's account four. So account four, all the movements are positive. So let's check it out now. So account four, and then the same condition. And every is not a function. And that's of course, because we are still missing the movements array. And now it is true, all right? And so that indeed proves that the every returns true if all the elements in the array satisfy this condition. Because in this movements array, all of the values are in fact above zero, okay? So that's how the every method works. And I think it's quite straightforward, isn't it? And now to finish, there is one more cool thing that I want to show you. So up until this point, we have always written the callback function directly as an argument into our array methods, right? However, we could also write this function separately and then pass the function as a callback. So let's say, a uh, separate callback. And so we could do this. So let's call the posit to this function. All right. And so this function here is exactly the same as these ones. But as I just said, there is no reason for them to being directly written uh, here in all of these array methods. We could simply write them like this, and then all we would have to do is to call movements.sum, for example, and then deposits or deposit. And now we could reuse the same function for all kinds of different methods that require callbacks with a true false condition. So that could be every or filter as well. Okay. And so here is the result of these uh, three operations. And so here we get the expected results and all by reusing this same function. Then if we wanted to change the function, all we would have to do is to change it here in one place. And then all the results would become different according to that. So in practice, that's something that we do sometimes because this is of course better for the dry principle. So don't repeat yourself. That's always important and it is important here as well. But anyway, uh, with this small detour that we did here, let's now move on to learning about two more array methods. 
The next two array methods that we're gonna learn are the flat and flat map methods. And thankfully, these are very easy to understand. So let's go. So let's say that we have an array with some arrays in it. So essentially a, a nested array. So let's say one, two, three, and then another array here, four, five, six, and then even some values like this. So this is perfectly normal, but what if we wanted to take all these uh, elements in the subarray and put all of these together in just one big array, which contains all the numbers here from one to eight? Well, that's pretty simple using the uh, new flat method. And they say new because flat and also flat map were introduced in ES 2019. So they are pretty recent. And one more time, they will therefore not work in super old browsers. Okay, and actually that's it for the flat method. So no callback function, just like this. And we get indeed uh, our full array from one to eight. So this removed the nested arrays and flattened the array, which is why the method is called flat. So very nice, very simple, and no callback function this time. Okay, but now let's say that we have uh, an array which is even deeper nested. So let's call it R deep. And so this one right now has only like one level of nesting. But let's say that these two here are in their own array still. And maybe these two here as well. So now we have an array inside an array inside an array. So let's see what happens when we flat this one. And we got the same result, but that's because I made this mistake. So we need to flatten error deep. And so uh, now you see that we get this result, which still contains the two inner arrays. All right, so this means that the flat method only goes one level deep when flattening the array. So this three here was inside the first level of nesting, and so therefore it was taken out and is now in the main array, but then we still have this nested array uh, in there. So we can fortunately fix that by using the death argument. So right now, uh, basically flat is running with the uh, one here as the death. And so if we run it with one, which is the default, then we get this, but we can go two levels deep. And so now we get the same result as before. And that's because it now goes even into the second level of nesting and also takes the element out of that array. All right. So that's how flat works, but this example is not really that useful. And so let's go back to the bank accounts. So let's say that the bank itself wants to calculate the overall balance of all the movements of all the accounts. So how would we go about solving this problem? Well, first of all, we have all these movements stored in arrays. And these arrays are inside the objects in the accounts array. Right, So in this array that we have been uh, using, so accounts, so that's the one. So this is where we have our movements. And so the first thing to do is to take them out of here and put them all into one array. So how would we do that? Well, let's create a variable here called uh, account movements. And so we could do accounts, uh, accounts like this. And then what we want to create uh, is a new array, but with the same length, which only contains these movements array. So that's what I was just saying, right? And so for that, we can use the map method. So in each account, take the account dot movements. And uh, so return that value into the new array. All right. And so now we have this array 
which then in turn contains the arrays of all the movements. And so you see that now we actually have a nested structure here. So an array which contains other arrays. And so probably you can see where I'm going with this because uh, now I want an array which simply contains all of these values just in one array. So let's call this one all movements. And so it's going to be account movements dot flat, right? And we have only one uh, level of nesting. And so there's not even a need for any parameter here. So for any argument. So now we get this uh, nice array of the length 29 with all of these movements. And now all we have to do is to add them all together, which is pretty easy at this point, right? So let's call this one overall balance is equal to all movements dot reduce. And here we get the accumulator and the current movement. And we return accumulator plus movement and we start with zero. So I'm doing this all very fast here because I already explained all of this multiple times at this point, right? And so here we get the final result of adding up all of these values that were originally as we started in the separate movements arrays that were in turn inside of the account objects, right? And of course we can make this here a lot more beautiful. So uh, instead of doing all of this separately, as you already know, we can use chaining. So we start with this here. So building a new array out of the array of uh, account objects, then we flat that uh, result and then we add it all together. So like this. And then we log it all to the console. And this is then uh, unnecessary. And actually I will just delete all of it. Give it a save. And here we get the exact same result. Now it turns out that using a map first and then flattening the result is a pretty common operation. So that's exactly what we have here. So first we map and then we flat that result. So that's exactly what we have here. And so to solve this, there is another method that was also introduced at the same time, which is flat map. And so flat map essentially combines a map and a flat method into just one method, which is better for performance. All right. So let's do this one here again, but this time with flat map. So actually we can just copy it and here I'm going to call it just a two. And so here uh, we will now use flat map instead. And since flat map also does mapping, it needs to receive exactly the same callback as a map method. Okay. So this is essentially a map method. Uh, all it does is in the end, it then flattens the uh, result. And so you see here the result uh, is the same. Now just notice that flat map here only goes one level deep and we cannot change it. So if you do need to go deeper than just one level, you still need to use the flat method. So anyway, keep these two in mind whenever you find yourself in a situation where you have nested arrays and need to work with them. And believe me, that happens more often than you think. And I believe that even in the course of this course, there is going to be another situation.